Okay. Uh, hi all. Uh, my name is Rob. Um, hi all. Uh, my name is Rob. Uh, shit. There's like an echo. Um, let me try to mute this mute. Uh, Rob, if you've um, got your brother, this is Cortina. This is Nam. Um, our talk is called sort of like the title is "When You Gaze Long Into the Machine, the Machine Gazes Back." Um, and this is a sort of like pre-recorded sort of media enhanced. I guess dialogue among a few characters, um, something like Lewis Carroll's conversations between Achilles and the tortoise, or sort of like Godel Escherbach, if you said that. Uh, it sort of meanders around a bunch of concepts or topics like neoliberal, neoliberalism, public opinion, game theory, and evolutionary dynamics, um, which are just mostly things that the three of us talk about together um, and enjoy. Um, I think the backstory is that Cortina and I had sort of made a short film um, essay uh, for a seminar that, that we kind of pitched, um, which was about the failures of this enlightenment and the industrial revolution um, kind of reflected in the genre of film noir. Um, and when we first had some conversations with Matt Prewitt, the, the radical exchange president, um, we, we, we had initially wanted to show that, but I, I think there were a bunch of kind of questions around copyrights and, and we decided just to try something new. And um, this is sort of like what we've prepared in the last month or so. Uh, and I, I, I won't say too much more. I, I, it, it, it's about 37 minutes or so. Um, a bunch of things that, that sort of like were on our minds at the time were Something like Walter Lippmann's Public Opinion is a great book, and, and sort of like thinking about legibility, something like James Scott's Seeing What the State um, and Metrics and Goals. Um, also, sort of like we've been reading a lot of David Foster Wallace, and so there are sort of hints of, of media and postmodernism here. Um, but anyway, I, I, won't, I won't say too much else. Um, I want to thank Radical Change for having us, and uh, I think we can get started. Have you all ever heard of this guy, Dan Bilzerian? You mean the guy on Instagram that's always surrounded by women, money, and guns, right? Yeah, that's the guy. Why do you bring him up? Well, it's just that I've been trying to think through a specific discomfort I've been having about the world. Something about how it generally feels reminds me of Dan Bilzerian. Your world is a non-stop hedonistic experience of primal gratification? And I thought you were a software engineer. No, that's not what I mean. I mean, I found his Instagram page the other day and spent about two hours absolutely absorbed by it. I can't shake the suspicion that there's something related between his Instagram page and that sense of discomfort. It's something that goes beyond the misogyny, the decadence, and the superficiality of his lifestyle. It's like he's a glimpse of where we're headed as a society, like he's the natural result of some underlying mechanism and he's not necessarily just one guy that we can condemn or write off with some sort of value judgment about his character. Yeah, I know what you mean. Looking at his Instagram now, it feels like looking in the mirror and seeing a reflection that you don't like, but one that you know captures some dark truth about human nature. You could look at him like you would look at natural phenomena. In a way, he kind of reminds me of the type of runaway signaling we see in nature. Take the peacock, for example. It's long and beautiful feathers are a signal of fitness. How's that? Well, because it requires physical strength to overcome that handicap in order to fly. And we call it an honest signal because it maps to actual fitness. Does Dan B really send in honest signals? Okay, maybe a better analogy might be a species that bluffs, like this ridiculous looking fiddler crab here. When they lose a claw, they occasionally regrow a large but weaker one that nevertheless intimidates crabs with smaller but stronger claws. That seems more like Dan B. He strategically projects an image of wealth and extravagance, and from that misrepresentation, he gains social influence, which he can trade for increasingly extreme images of wealth and extravagance, which garner even more social influence, and so on. Eventually, he's more wealthy just by projecting wealth, just as the crab is more fit by projecting fitness. Well, that's what's really interesting, I think. 
a lot of modern culture or at least pretty much all consumer advertising and marketing it seems to presuppose bluffing as a foregone conclusion like everyone knows the way you communicate is through symbols and i could just sell you the symbol of fitness and then you can just buy the symbol without any need for underlying fitness and you see stuff like this in the clothes people wear to the books they keep on their shelves or the photos they put on their profiles yeah and, and it just feels like all of our effort increasingly goes into these communication games it's like an arms race of sorts and it's accelerating History sort of confirms that over the past few hundred years, economic production has shifted its focus from use value to exchange value and now on to sign value, moving up the stack of abstraction. Well, there are good reasons why we might want to invest deeply in communication. I mean, we are a social species. And you could probably attribute our dominant position in the natural world largely due to social intelligence as opposed to, you know, some physical skill or strength. So maybe there's a good argument for investing in the skill of signaling as a sort of abstract technology, independent of what it is that we're signaling. Maybe this is fine, assuming it's more like the peacock than the fiddler crab. Well, considering the fiddler crab, you might argue that sign value is just as effective as use value, just cheaper. It makes sense that everyone would invest more in signaling today than ever before in the past because, well, thanks to the internet, we all interact with way more people than we did 100 years ago. Maybe you used to have more time to build up a model, you know, based on real data of one another's behavior when things were more local and you interacted with fewer people. Sure, maybe signaling is a sort of compression mechanism that helps us all deal with an increasingly complex world. But what still concerns me is that there's a feedback loop where many iterations of optimization start to select for particular outcomes. So this pursuit of production efficiency leads to goods that tend to be uniform. One's a different veneer or style, but not actual utility, right? Yeah, when you're talking about the production of physical goods on an assembly line, then yeah. But like you were just saying, we've moved up the stack. And now what we're industrializing is the signaling process. So now what happens when you take all the capital and innovation that used to go into optimizing production, and you redirect it towards optimizing demand, the mass media, marketing, and advertising. Which, by the way, means making consumer purchases more predictable. And which, by the way, means making my behavior and your behavior more predictable. Fashion is a good business because something's always in fashion. Exactly. So in the same way you might investigate the ruthless pursuit of efficiency on the assembly line to try to understand a weird product flaw, I think maybe we can investigate the pursuit of efficiency and demand generation to try to understand weird consumer behavior. And weird cultural phenomena because consumerism dominates so much of our culture nowadays. Which means maybe this helps us to understand Dan B. Right. So let's imagine we're this profit maximization machine and consider what Rob looks like to us. Now, in reality, Rob is pretty complex. He has a diverse set of goals and values and things that he cares about. And what he cares about changes over time. Modeling all this would be really complex. So why not simplify and just assert that our interests are aligned with Rob's when he communicates value by incurring the cost of purchasing something from us. And profit for us is value for Rob. Yeah. But remember, we're just talking about optimizing the demand side of the equation. So we can forget about production cost and COGS and all that, and just worry about customer acquisition cost and revenue. Okay, that's pretty interesting. From this perspective, all of the actual production becomes an invariant. Yeah, exactly. And there's a whole science of metrics for optimizing the demand side. You want to optimize retention by reducing churn to make sure the average customer LTV justifies the customer acquisition cost. By the way, isn't it funny that companies call it customer lifetime value when it's really value to the company and cost to the customer? It could just as easily be called customer lifetime cost. It's also ironic that when we talk about this from the individual's point of view, we talk about Maslow's pyramid, but from the point of view of the machine, it's a marketing funnel. Yeah, I think these inversions that y'all pointed out are significant. And what happens is we just assert that the equation balances. What, what I mean is that 
the customer gets value and we profit. And so then when we start optimizing, we say that because this equation balances, we can just look at our half of the equation. And so like, let's imagine now we have a universe of products and we're able to produce all of them relatively efficiently and sell them at roughly the same gross margin. If we look at it this way, how do we decide what to sell? Just sell whatever there is the most demand for. Classically, yes. But remember, now we're able to spend money influencing demand. Ah, so now the game becomes how cheap can you generate demand? Yeah, and that's where all the competition seems to be happening now. Every point of friction in this marketing funnel leads to drop off. Friction is less efficient and more costly to us, so our objective is to minimize it. So say we're optimizing the evaluation step and we're selecting products from our inventory. We want to choose those which will result in the least amount of drop off here. So for example, things that offer immediate gratification. Yep. And things that require the least deliberation and coordination. Anything that requires you to achieve consensus with others. And even your future self. Yep. Any kind of coordination before purchasing is very likely going to introduce lag, give you more time to think about whether or not you really want something, give you the opportunity to be convinced by somebody else not to buy something. All of these are going to create huge drop off at the evaluation step. So optimization for an efficient funnel biases towards a particular inventory. Yes. And specifically the most selfish products that satisfy your most immediate desires. And your attention, like shelf space at the supermarket, is finite. So there has to be a prioritization that determines what gets the shelf space. Or ad space. And if our optimization function is something like LTV over CAC, or minimizing purchase friction, the result might not map to your long-term values. Right. So the intersection is aligned in the sense that your set of options is a set of things you do value but it's just not really aligned in terms of ranking with your long-term values. And remember, we're not just talking about the set of products available to you. We're talking about all the information you encounter, nearly all of which is mediated by someone else with their own interests in mind. A corporation, a journalist, a politician, or just another person. If all of this is optimized to serve your interests in the same way, then how can you ever trust anything to be aligned with your long-term values. That's really bleak, but it does feel right. If there is a systemic misalignment of incentives built into our society, then technological leverage will probably just compound the problem, yielding even more misalignment and more asymmetry. And Dan B all of a sudden has 31 million followers. And counting. Well, no one says we have to participate. We could just walk away. Yeah, get flip phones, delete our social media accounts, go offline, just Walden Pond it. I guess. But the thing is, I don't want to live in a cabin out in the woods. I like the city. I like that I can buy a pencil instead of having to make one myself. I like that I can eat tacos on a Tuesday night and surf the internet. Yeah, but maybe we just need to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Have you ever read this story, The Ones Who Walk Away From Omelas? It's about this utopian city where residents enjoy abundance, freedom, and creativity. But at some point in each person's life, they have to go and witness a single child who lives in misery, darkness, and filth in order to sustain the entire city's population. Most are disgusted, but they ultimately accept that the utopia is worth the price of this one child's suffering. But each year, a few of the citizens that can't bear this injustice silently walk away from the city, and no one seems to know where they go. My issue is that if you just leave, you don't fix anything. And even if you tune out, it cuts you off from other people. And if you do that, then how do you coordinate on an alternative? Okay, so maybe we don't have to completely walk away. Maybe there are smaller ways to resist while staying connected to others. Then you have the opportunity to reform. And if enough people do that, maybe real systemic change can be brought about from the bottom up. For example, people are excited about things like browsers that don't track your habits, ad blockers, things like that. And I heard about this AR ad block app called NoAd. It replaces the New York City subway ads with art. 
You can imagine that with this kind of stuff, you can get public spaces to look like Sao Paulo after the billboard advertising ban. The pictures were surreal. Shocking. A non-dystopian use case for AR. Or what about a browser plugin that changes buy now buttons into buy later buttons? I experimented with this in a low tech way. You know, I tried to go a full year without buying any non-essential items not too long ago. Just having this rule made it easier to make decisions that were better aligned with my long-term goals. I like this whole conversation about leveling the playing field and reducing information asymmetry. And I'm on board with ad block or ad bans, but I'm worried that even if you do pull off something like this at scale, at the end of the day, you still end up in some sort of information landscape where even without ads, adversarial agents could infiltrate and figure out how to pull the same old tricks in new ways. It's like a black hat, white hat arms race. We need counterintelligence for the average citizen. Median. How about as a public service? There are some good examples in other domains, like the food pyramid. It's a useful tool for navigating the complexity of nutrition. Well, that's a great example because it demonstrates the risk of political capture. Thanks to lobbying by meat producers over the last 40 years, federal dietary advice has evolved from, quote, decreased consumption of meat to, quote, have two or three servings a day. Fine. Then the Surgeon General's warning on cigarettes. Point. Which might in practice look something like this when you're talking about information. Point. Then there's information disclosure, like FDA labeling of food products. While more difficult to quantify than nutrition information, we might be able to at least label content as entertainment versus advertising versus research versus journalism. Point. Okay, but this gets back to the issue of regulatory capture and lobbying. So you'll get things like, quote, research run by pharmaceutical companies with an interest in selling you a particular drug. Counterpoint. But that's exactly why you want stuff like the FTC rules on when and how online influencers need to disclose sponsorships and paid partnerships to their followers. You could have the same sort of system for labeling research with, you know, who's paying for this message? What's their angle? How do they make money? Like they say, follow the money. We could also attempt to educate consumers and give them the tools to make more informed decisions. That could look like a test for minimum knowledge, like the driver's license test. Imagine taking a class in school that taught you the basics of how marketing works. You know, all that LTV over CAC, conversion rate, retention, churn stuff, plus the implications on your behavior and social behavior, not to mention tactics to counteract. And then test the ability to process brand messages and persuasive intent. If we couple this with a ban on advertising to children, this might lead to a population better able to think critically and defend against persuasion as adults. I feel like we've crossed over from bottoms up to top down territory, which means we're back to the problem of governance and arbitration. And the people competing for power to make these decisions are competing for attention and votes. So you're subject to the same pressures and the same tactics that we see in the commercial landscape. Votes already track campaign dollars, so it feels like the emergent behavior of democracy has already converged with advertising. Yeah, and the idea of a politician like JFK who inspired people to ask what they can do for their country rather than campaigning on empty promises, it just seems like such a distant memory. And it's almost as preposterous as a corporate ad that asks you to expend any sort of your own effort. As a consumer or voter, this just sounds like a lot of work. It is a lot of work, especially when you compare it to every other message you're likely to encounter in our information ecosystem that tells you you don't have to do any work. You just sit back and listen to the promises that you can have all the things you want, and all you have to do is click buy now. Or vote this way. Well, so much for the top-down approach. Back to bottoms up? Feels like we're going in circles. Well, maybe we've made some progress. We've established that the health of the system is a function of the emergent behavior of individuals, which in turn are shaped by the mechanics that various actors are optimizing in order to achieve specific goals like maximizing profits or winning elections. So I guess the question is, if the top-down alternative would fail and fall prey to these same mechanics, is there a bottom-up way to propagate a new set of micro behaviors that tend in a different macro direction? One interesting model that this conversation reminds me of is the prisoner's dilemma. It describes a class of problems where cooperation leads to the better collective outcome, 
but selfishness always leads to a better individual outcome. This is a good model for many social interactions. If you cooperate with an honest person, the two of you can achieve a good outcome. But if you cheat and exploit an honest player, you can get a great outcome at their expense. And of course, if you both cheat on each other, you both end up with a bad outcome. That feels like what we've been talking about. Self-interest is always a logical choice to make. But at the macro level, this leads to a pretty terrible world that no one's happy with. Which is kind of depressing, but it gets a little more interesting and optimistic. Yes, the best strategy is to always cheat if you find yourself in this kind of situation with someone. And you might think that if you repeatedly find yourself in this situation with the same person, your best strategy is to always act selfishly. But surprisingly, it isn't. Really? That's cool. So it's in your best interest to act selfishly if you play once, but if you play the same game many times with the same people, suddenly selfishness becomes suboptimal? Exactly. One of the best strategies that we know about is surprisingly simple. Just default to being cooperative. Otherwise, be nice to those who are nice to you and retaliate against those who try to exploit you. It turns out this strategy works really well regardless of who the other players are. Tip for tat. In theory, we could get an optimal collective outcome in this game if everyone always cooperates, right? Right. But I wouldn't bank on it. If just one bad actor is tempted in that world by personal gain, they quickly exploit everyone. There's a line from Jack Handy that comes to mind. I can picture in my mind a world without war, a world without hate, and I can picture us attacking that world because they'd never expect it. Ha, yeah. Totally nice and trusting people are amazing and essential, but it seems that the world can only support so many of them. Is there some way to apply this to the conversation at hand? Well, the behavior of each agent is a function of their payoff makers, which really comes down to their beliefs about payoffs, i.e. their values. Ah, uh, okay. So this is where things like marketing, politics, and education come into play. They influence the values and beliefs of the agents, which in turn dictate the behaviors, which in turn dictate the top-level equilibrium. Right. In the short run, it seems like the game creates the players, but when you apply to social models, you realize that the players create the game. Because at the end of the day, the payout matrices are a function of collective morality and aesthetics. So Dan B then would seem to embody a specific type of morality and aesthetic that resembles the defection strategy, which puts a heavier bias toward self-interested outcomes and a lower bias on collectively beneficial outcomes. Then Dan B's popularity supports the intuition that we might be embedded in a social environment where the defection strategy is both effective and common even though we know that tit-for-tat is a generally robust strategy in a social environment that values collective goals more heavily. Exactly. And the same kind of thinking can support why demand generation is the kind of game we're playing in the consumer landscape. So does this model tell us how to change the rules of the game so that they would tend towards more favorable collective outcomes? I mean, it does in the sense that it gives you a framework for describing assumptions and simulating how things might turn out, given those assumptions. But the hard work in solving runaway prisoners dilemma like this still involves a lot of difficult social work and coordination to make progress. For example, the other classically hard prisoners dilemma problem that this looks like is climate change. You can get further if you burn a lot of natural resources, but the better collective outcome is that you show restraint and operate more sustainably. But if you don't exploit the local resources and you live in an unregulated environment, other players probably will, and it'll be very profitable for them to do that. That's a bleak example, because it seems that we are so far along in the climate game that it's hard to course correct at this point. If you look at the data, we've exhausted more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere during the last century alone than we have for all 200,000 years of human history before that. On top of that, we've known that this is an existential problem for decades, but our rate of emission is still increasing because it's been both profitable and convenient to continue the trend. But let's not forget that all of that energy consumption has been directly responsible for our ability to support billions of humans on Earth, enable long-range transport, give us the internet. It is the best time to be alive. Mortgage, by the way, against the sustainability of not just the Anthropocene, but the entire biosphere. 
Okay, now I'm back to my sense of despair. Well, maybe one way to think about this problem is to reframe it. Sure, maybe the problem is hopeless if we think about our current conditions and context as immutable, exogenous. Maybe the current systems for coordination incentivize the always defect strategy. But rather than throwing our hands up in defeat, why not think about redefining our context and conditions so that they promote cooperation? Say more. Well, we said that 200 years ago, when your environment was more local, you played more of an iterated game where cooperation made a lot of sense. Then a set of historical trends, globalization and what have you, shifted the conditions to look more like the single game. So why not look at ways to restructure the game to promote cooperation? As just one example, one of the things that made the local game more cooperative was your personal reputation within a smaller society. Yeah, I think a way to look at civilization since the Industrial Revolution is that we've been doing a bit of funny accounting, moving some of the externalities off the books. Climate change, for example. And not to say all the progress we've made over the last few hundred years isn't worth it, but we just need to acknowledge the cost, the debt that we've racked up. So in the same way that reputation forced you to internalize the cost of defecting, maybe we need to think more proactively about ways to do this. This is the idea that motivates carbon credits. One problem with that is that our sanctions have kind of lost their bite. If China, for example, were to defect in terms of policy that ignores climate change, we don't really have the option to stop trading with them. And do we really want to start a war over that? One, actually the U.S. is the only country that has defected and withdrawn from the Paris Agreement. Two, China has been making more progress on green tech than us. And three, maybe this is a good motivation for the U.S. to bring manufacturing back in-house. Easier said than done. Still, it feels a bit too top-down for me. I wonder if there's a way to do more of a bottoms-up approach. You know, I've been thinking that austerity gets kind of a bad rap. And by austerity, I don't mean cutting state spending. I mean reducing individual consumption. I wonder if we can somehow course correct with a bottoms-up shift in values that promotes austerity over consumption. Of course, every business on earth would lobby and do PR campaigns against this sort of thinking. And almost certainly no politician would have the courage to endorse it because it just sounds like a lot of work and no fun. I mean, yes, sure. A responsible, austere body politic sounds ideal, but also very unlikely. The reason why the perverse mechanics of Dan Bilzerian, demand generation, and climate change all look congruent in the frame of game theory is that they all trade global benefits against individual benefits, long-term sustainable goals against short-term gratifications. Climate change and runaway commercial incentives are particularly difficult systemic dilemmas that if we have any chance at solving, we have to be clear, it won't be easy. There is not a solution that will show up and solve these problems in a gentle way without disrupting our lives. Making in ways will likely require real sacrifices with respect to personal convenience and pleasure, not to mention personal liberty and freedom. These are things that Westerners, particularly individualist Americans, are both unaccustomed to and sensitive about. For example, for a chance to avert climate disaster, we probably have to accept that our children's quality of life won't necessarily be better than ours. In fact, that's held unequivocally and consistently true since the Industrial Revolution. To fix deep systemic problems, we'd need radical policy changes and likely equally serious social changes. Some maybe crazy ones off the top of my head dramatically increase the cost of air travel, inflate the cost of exploiting natural resources like coal, lumber, gas, and oceanic fishing. Consider advertising regulations, which would involve certain bans like billboard advertising and just general ad temperance online. The internet to date has been almost completely unregulated in America, but we should seriously consider whether or not that's a good thing, considering its relevance with respect to information and community dynamics. We should seriously consider the effects of a UBI, given that we're a democracy and that your proximity to subsistence directly influences both how you think and how much time you have to deliberate. 
we probably should reconsider the metrics that we use to measure national success. GDP has had a disproportionate public mind share, but we could be emphasizing other dimensions like the Gini coefficient, median household income, the suicide rate. We should maybe consider the suggestion that the star-spangled Ralph Emerson American individualistic worldview is at least in part responsible for the current irresponsible social dynamics and possibly start to ennoble certain socialist virtues. I don't mean to rant. It's just that hoping for a bottom-up solution feels totally insufficient. And let's not forget, by the way, that the onus to promote long-term civilizational goals is more on the state than it is on the individual. So where does that leave us? Maybe somewhere in the middle. Policies, power structures, incentives, and goals are grounded in a society's belief about how the world works. So while systemic changes may not emerge bottoms up, the sentiment or will to change the system can. And this can ultimately serve as the justification for radical policy change. Without bottoms up demand for change, new policies would feel unjustified or even authoritarian. And the good news is that it does feel like there is a sentiment or awareness emerging in society that there is a disconnect between broadly held values and the current regime. Like per capita GDP not being a great metric to measure the well-being of society. I think you're right. People aren't in the streets right now celebrating the bull market. Yeah, and when this awareness emerges, history seems to say that three things can happen. One, a self-serving demagogue capitalizes on and confirms this sentiment, but does nothing to actually move things in the right direction. Sounds familiar. Two, we throw the baby out with the bathwater. I see a lot of people calling for that, like people demanding we throw out the very idea of measurement. And honestly, this is the failure mode I'm the most worried about right now. For three, you do the hard, mostly thankless work of demonstrating, in a way that everyone can understand, exactly how the current policies don't integrate or account for important broadly held values, and maybe in fact existing policies reinforce the wrong behaviors. And this creates a space for policy reform. Yeah, and then the work turns to defining, again in a way that's broadly accessible, a new, perhaps radically different, set of policies that is more aligned with what society values and metrics that we can hold leaders and institutions accountable to. This last bit is really critical, as Obama wrote recently, so that leaders don't just pay lip service to the demands of society and then return to business as usual as soon as the street's empty. I think you're right to acknowledge that the work is thankless. Given that we're up against feedback loops that are compounding in scale and complexity, course-correcting civilization at this point seems hopeless, if we're honest about it. Well, sometimes when I'm looking into the face of despair like this, it's comforting to remember Camus' interpretation of Sisyphus as the absurd hero. The struggle itself toward the heights is enough to fill a man's heart. One must imagine Sisyphus is happy. Yeah, it's daunting. But we have work to do. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to take a few minutes here Thank for you some so much. Q&A. Uh, we're going to take a Hey y'all. All right. Thanks everyone for uh, joining us for that. Um, I think we'll do some Q and A now. So just looking through the questions, I'm actually going to start uh, with the second one. And there's only two questions and we have a bunch of time. So if you have some questions and you're on late night, throw them in the chat. Um, but I wanna start with this one from anonymous um, with respect to regulatory capture, how do you stop massive lobbying campaigns before the problem is acknowledged widely? For example, cigarettes back when. Yeah, I mean, I, this is one of the reasons I, uh, I thought it was important to include um, this example of, of lobbying and uh, uh, in here. And I'll just 
because I think a lot of this stuff it's upstream from decision making, right? Like you, you're you're the decisions that you make or the decisions that a uh, a citizenry makes are only going to be as good as the information that they have. And one of the challenges right now, um, lobbying is a good example of this. And also we, we showed that um, that correlation uh, from INET about how votes track money. Right now you can pretty much just trade money for, for influence and trade money for um, putting sort of like very biased misinformation up in front of people. Um, so I think this is a really, really hard problem and it's not like, I, I don't think like a different mechanism for voting solves it. I do think some of the ideas, um, you know, that inform quadratic voting about, you know, how do you sort of like mitigate the effects of um, compounding returns on power are applicable. So one, one example um, of how you might do this, you know, with things like lobbying or, or advertising or campaign finance is you could put quadratic taxes on those things. I think this is, of course, pretty difficult to pull off in the US. Like I actually have talked about this with a bunch of different people. And I think at least in the US, you would run up into a bunch of different counter arguments about how, you know, taxing things like campaign finance or advertising or lobbying or limiting people's uh, First Amendment rights. But I do think that you know, given that you can trade money for uh, for audience and reach, we really need to rethink how we think about, you know, the First Amendment as sort of like an absolute right. And I think given the state of technology today, a, a, something like a quadratic tax on, on advertising and lobbying, and all sorts of ways you can spend money to disseminate information would be completely appropriate. Um, so that was the first one. Um, second one, um, from Mako, um, have you heard of the instrumental convergence thesis, uh, the principle that competitive fitness just leads to a few tasteless goals, hoard strength, um, I will quickly say, and then kind of see if Rob and Nam have anything else, that I had not heard of it, but I saw your question earlier and I Googled it and I saw on the Wikipedia page, um, it mentioned the paperclip maximizer. So <laughs> I have heard of the paperclip maximizer story, um, where you can, you know, have this sort of like instrumental goal, and if you if you go through enough iterations, optimizing it leads to sort of like absurd um, outcomes and perverse outcomes. Um, the other thought I had about this, and and maybe this is a good point to kind of like get into a little back and forth banter with Rob. I we had this uh, chat. Uh, about this uh, talk that we were preparing. And I was kind of arguing that um, I think with like a lot of the social systems that we've built and technology, we've done a pretty good job of mimicking uh, the, like fitness functions from evolution. And we've, we've done less to mimic um, sort of like random mutation. I mean, there's a lot of randomness. It, it's just that like, we we so far like compound the returns to whatever is winning with respect to fitness that I think we've sort of underdone the random mutation and like um, you know I, I think it would be useful to have more antitrust and more things that basically like uh, help help the little guys who are like you know if if there is a random mutation kind of like making space for it to grow effectively. Um, I don't know, Rob, if you remember this conversation or if you had like a different comment in response to this question. Yeah, I mean, what this reminds me of is is sort of like the conversation around like the seeing like a state um, type of thing where, where I think the tension there was that, you know, you, you have these sort of like, uh, kind of if you drive society by by a bunch of metrics and and, and you have to sort of know ahead of time that the, the, the metrics aren't sort, sort of like, they're overspecified. They're they're sort of like one dimensional. They measure very specific things, but that is sort of like you you know ostensibly supposed to represent kind of like these broader multi multi dimensional goals. But but you know of course they, they they always sort of like fail to capture that completely. And 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 this sort of like it, 
I think this kind of gets to, you know, a lot of, it, 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 naturally you get this paranoia in, in artificial intelligence or something because, you know, it's like, you know, these like very, very long levers on a lot of power and, and, and all you have access to really, in, in, at least in a lot of the current models is, is that like, you know, put it in a specification and like kind of let it go and it'll go really fast and far with that. And I think similar kind of conversation goes with, with policymaking where, where it's just like, you know, you, it's almost paralysis. It's like, how, how do you pick all, like, how do you even start to pick goals and metrics and, and it, like realizing that metrics are essential sort of like measurement and health and you have to pick something, but like, you know, knowing ahead of time that, that, that there are like very real hazards of, of, of sort of like whatever metrics you, you choose. And I, like in another way, I, I think this kind of like instrumental convergence thing is, is related to our talk just in, in, in the very plain sense that like, I, I think sort of like in the absence of being able to sort of like, I, I, I think a lot of the like narrative around like our time sort of like postmodernism is, and um, I'll, I'll wrap up this question so that we can kind of get to other ones. Um, is that you know there, there there's sort of this like evaporation of meaning and 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 I think kind of like one of the general ten tendencies or like responses is is to like you know just ba basically kind of like chase what are more or less instrumental goals that that are you know like I I, I feel like when, when you look at this generation you look at like why they're sad or why they're depressed it's it's because you know it's like like what do you have to to sort of go for it. It's just like you can maximize the amount of money you make or something like that. Um, and, and, and you, you sort of recognize that, that, that like these are sort of like broadly accepted goals that, that like you should go and, and, and fulfill somehow, but, but, you know, the, 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 just from a personal perspective, they're, they're like very deeply unfulfilling. Um, and, and so in a way, like we, we are kind of like at this social paperclip map, maximizer type of situation, I think. Okay. Uh, potentially related questions to some of the stuff that you just touched on. Can you speak more about what a culture of austerity would look like? Can a non-consumptive society be a higher value output society? What do you measure here? Um, this, is a, this is an interesting question in terms of like output or productivity. Um, one thought that we, we've been kicking around is, um, you know, why does it have to go all back into consumption? Why not start giving people time back? You know, like Keynes had this idea that people would be working 15 hours per week eventually. But um, I think a, a culture of austerity could be one in, in which perhaps, you know, instead of working 40 hours per week or 70 hours per week or, you know, working multiple jobs, you, you work. 20 hours per week and you have more time to spend, you know, with the people that you love or spend doing the things that you love or uh, spend more time just enjoying life. I think uh, that would be a really interesting uh, alternative that is more austere and perhaps measured in um, sort of like median numbers of hours worked per citizen. Um, and, you know, getting that lower would potentially be good. Um, Robert and Nam, do you have any responses on the austerity one? Nam, do you? Right. I, I, I feel like one thing that, something like a, a sort of allegory that we talked about a lot when going through writing this was, was sort of like the, um, this, this story of sort of in, I think it was the Iliad where um, Odysseus sort of binds himself to the mast, um, kind of like before they visit this island of the sirens. Um, and I, I think like with respect to austerity or like kind of this way of thinking that there's, it, it, there's definitely like a sentiment in my mind uh, or, around just like kind of asceticism or, or just like recognizing that like at this point and, and especially towards like something like social media or something where, where it was just like, you know, thousands of some of the most brilliant minds in the world are being paid a lot of money to kind of like 
basically answer the question, how do we get more people to spend more time on this? And they're, they're very, very good at their jobs. And, and just as an individual, you know, you, you know, I, I, you know I, I feel some sense of agency or like kind of ability to think about things and, and, and introspect, but at some level, I think I have to recognize that, that these structures are probably more powerful than, than I am and, 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 and can like find ways to sort of exploit my sense of agency. And, and, and I think that drives this kind of like almost impulse that, that like, you know, I, I have to impose some like just rules on myself or, or something like that. that. That kind of looks like what we're calling austerity here. Okay, uh, question from Anonymous. The average person on earth lives off $3 in value per day. Are you ready to take on the level of austerity for a 15 hour work week? Um, I, yeah, I, I wonder how much of this problem is the number of average, you know, average hours worked or sort of the distribution of proceeds um, for which the number of people are working right now. Um, I'm not sure that if a lot of people worked less than, uh, I'm not, I'm not sure how like related these problems are. The, the average person living off of $3 in value per day to me seems like a distribution problem, not necessarily a, uh, how many hours per, uh, week is everyone working? Any comments from y'all on that? Okay. Um, why is it even harder for me as a user to have finer grain control? Oh, this is from Eli. Why is it ever harder for me as a user to have finer grain control of the algorithms guiding my attention, e.g. TikTok? I would pay more for such control. I think this is an interesting uh, point. Um, I, I, I would, and you know, I'll take a first crack at this, but interrupt me guys if you want one, but one thing is like doing that, like that level of control takes a lot of work um, and effort. And um, I think there totally would be some demand for uh, services that offer more control. I wonder how much adoption they would get. Like I wonder, I, I feel like we, we, would, we would have a tough <laughs> time getting people to invest that level uh, of effort, but maybe that's wrong. But I, you know, I would love to see a lot more services out there that gave you more control over the dials, you know, like turn up the randomness on my YouTube recommendations and just be able to do that per session would be great. I, like that would be awesome. Yeah. I, my suspicion is just, it's not really in TikTok's interest to, give people yeah. control over that. Um, and so there, there, there's probably something deeper at the incentive layer or like. Um, okay, uh, two minutes left. So we'll do one more question. Um, how about from Clint, uh, how about creating new forms of digitized value assets that give more credit for enhancing the human condition instead of just wealth accumulation? Yeah, I think that would be pretty interesting. I wonder, and y'all stop me, I feel like I just am de facto taking first step at these since I'm reading the questions. But I've, I've thought a lot about this. Something Nam and I talked about was like, are there examples of you know societal value shifting, um, kind of like incentivizing some sort of like more moral behavior in, in the sense that it's like moral in that it has the collective interest in is the behavior is more in line with the collective interest than pure consumption um some sort of like value shift like that would be interesting it's tough to find historical examples of this working um i think maybe like religions were a shot at some sort of like non-monetary form of value to to reward people with but you know these systems also can and have been exploited by people in positions of power. So um, while I like the idea of this and it's something I've spent a lot of time thinking about, it, it's not obvious to me like what exactly, exactly the answer is. 
Okay, I think that's all we have time for. Sorry, like Rob, if you have like 10 more seconds, I'll just say thank you uh, to everyone and then, yeah, kick it yeah, over. Yeah, thank you.